Hi, I'm Ron Watson, pastor of First Presbyterian Church here in slightly cloudy Ocala, Florida. We're so glad you could come and worship with us today. I do want to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, the first is we'll be having a food drive in October, and uh, here is the date right there. Uh, do put that on your calendar, and we hope you can participate. We'll be giving you more details as the time gets closer. Also remember the first Sunday in November, November 1st, which is All Saints Day, will be our big tent meeting out on the lawn behind our fellowship hall. We really hope you can worship with us in person that day. Uh, it'll be Stewardship Sunday. Also, uh, we want to see uh, how the tent works out for our worship service. We're going to be wearing masks too, so uh, we're doing whatever we can to uh, uh, make you feel safe. Uh, as possible. If, if that's not good enough, though, you can stay in your car and we hope to be broadcasting on our special FM transmitter. If that doesn't work, maybe you can crack the window. Uh, again, we're doing this to also to find out how it's going to work at Christmas time when we hope to do it a second time. Have a great tent meeting. Worship began in a tent and uh, it'll be good for us to go back to the uh, roots of worship, as it were. I'm glad you came to worship with us today. Welcome to church. Good morning from just outside Ocala. Let's be called to worship. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he's done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He's revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He's remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous songs and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. Oh 
join me for a confession of sin. O God, our Redeemer, we confess that we remain captivated by sin. You shower your blessing upon us, yet we continue to complain. You give us more than we deserve, yet we resent your goodness to others. Forgive us. Liberate us. Let us be no longer bound by sin, but released, restored, set free to worship and serve you in freedom through Jesus Christ our Lord. I invite you to silent prayer. Amen. My friends, Jesus loves you. He lived and died and rose for you. We are forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi kids, Pastor Walk here. Got a story for you. You're not going to believe it. In a minute, Pastor Ron is going to preach about Jonah when he was in Nineveh. But I want to tell you what happened before he got there. You're, you're not going to believe this. Jonah was um, a prophet, and God spoke to him and said, I want you to go to Nineveh, that evil city, and I want you to proclaim my word to them. And Jonah didn't want to. Jonah wanted to go as far from where God told him to go, I know, as far away from where God told him to go as he could, and he tried to get away from God, and you and I know he can't. So he got on a ship, he paid his passage, and he was going to go to Tarshish, as far away from Nineveh as he could, and God sent a storm. And the waves were rocking, and the ship was rocking, and the sailors were afraid. They were from all over the world. They prayed to their gods, and they did no good. And finally, Jonah said, it's me. I am trying to flee from God. I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord who made heaven and earth. He controls the wind and the waves. You better toss me over. And the, the sailors wouldn't do that, but the storm got worse. And, and they threw him overboard. And the wind and the, the storm ceased. And the wind ceased and Jonah sank and a big fish swallowed him up. I told you you weren't going to believe it. And he was in the belly of the fish for three days. And, and he praised God. I won't read to you the long psalm of praise that he composed in the belly of the fish, but he praised God. And after three days, God spoke to the fish, and the fish spat Jonah up on the side of the beach. He spat him up on the land, and God spoke to Jonah again. He said, go to Nineveh, that great city and deliver to them the word that I'm going to give you. <sighs> Jonah cleaned himself off and walked to Nineveh. And in that big city, he preached about God. And he told them to repent. And they did. Everyone repented, down to the animals. The king and everyone else repented. And Jonah was amazed. And if you want to know what happens next, listen to Pastor Ron's story. Thanks, kids. All the 
kingdom of heaven is like this, Jesus said. There was a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. He went out about nine o'clock. He saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went, and he went out again at noon and three o'clock, and he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said, why are you standing idle all day? They, they said, no, no one's hired us. He said, go also into my vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, e each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, th they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they, they, they grumbled against the landowner and said, these only worked an hour and you made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Are you envious because I am generous? So, Jesus said, the last will be first, and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we go to God in prayer, I want to note that um, Ella Charmley's brother Henry died this week. Henry Gibbons uh, lived in Melbourne, and he passed away, and we send our love and sympathy to her and her family and, and their extended family. Also, um, Hank Fleming had surgery this week and is doing well, as did John Yorlando. And John is Evelyn's husband. Evelyn, you all know, keeps our nursery when we have a church nursery. And he's doing well, and as is Howard Tucker. 
who had surgery about 10 days ago. So lots of folks to pray for. Also to pray for fires out west. We have church members with adult children who live out west, and um, we have church members with adult children who live in Pensacola and other places affected by Hurricane Sandy. To my knowledge, everyone's family is all right, is not in danger, but we, we, we pray for all of them. Let us pray. Generous God, you come to us again and again, no matter how late it is in the day or in our lives, calling to us, gathering us in. You give us your good work to do, daily bread and boundless grace. Increase in us a generous spirit so that we may do your work with joy alongside others whom you also love. We celebrate your salvation not only in our lives, but in the lives of other people, even those we had not imagined would be included in the kingdom you are bringing. Align us with your ways and help us to receive your gift of justice and mercy and good news. With, the mind, with one mind in Christ and one heart in the Spirit, let us pray to the Lord of heaven and earth. In your name, O oh Jesus, we pray for the church. Give us joy in our faith and life together, sharing the hope of the gospel and living as a sign of your saving love. We pray for your creation. Show us that it's not too late to receive your mercy. Shelter your creatures from wildfires in the American West and flooding waters in the American South. We pray for those in Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, affected by this terrible storm family members all over the nation affected by weather and by fires. In the name of Jesus, we pray for all nations, especially we pray for our own, for the men running for president and their advisors. We lift up and pray for President Trump, for all in his cabinet. We pray for the Congress, for their leaders, and our leaders closer to home. For all who wear America's uniform, we lift up and pray for them, O oh Lord. Let the last be first and the first be last. Let the high and mighty learn humility and the lowly feel, find your dignity. We pray in your mercy for those who are ill, for those who are grieving, for those who feel down, depressed, discouraged, let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as tis in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your generosity to First Presbyterian Church and your participation in our ministries through your giving. You may still give three ways. Uh, you may give in person for the church mail slot. You may uh, use the U.S. Postal Service, which will use the same mail slot. Or you may also give online. And you may do that by going to our website, which you see below, fpcocala.org. Just click on Give, and you may give online. However you give, we thank you for your support. Let us pray. 
Eternal and gracious God, we thank you for the many gifts you have bestowed on your people. We return a portion of what you have given us so that your will may be known and done throughout the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? <laughs> that is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor, and which you did not grow it, came into being in a night, and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, Lord, I my son. 
temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my The inexorable will of God. Every now and then, a word comes to me from my seventh grade vocabulary class, and I was seeking to describe what this sermon might be about, namely the will of God. The word inexorable popped into my head. It's a good word, which hardly is ever used in the common vernacular, an adjective, meaning impossible to stop or prevent. Jonah, perhaps, did not know this about God. If Jonah had known, it seems unlikely that he would have gone to such great lengths. You remember, he ran away on a ship and ended in the belly of an ocean beast, trying to escape God's will for him. But if he had known that God's will is inexorable, he might have just given in. Funny thing about the will of God is that we proclaim it each Sunday in praying our Lord's Prayer, we use the phrase, Thy will be done, which is all at once our submission to God, as well as our proclamation of God's inexorable will. Within this context, we now turn again to the story of Jonah. If you have studied the Old Testament even just a bit, then you you know that being a prophet was the worst job in the Bible. Generally, prophets were ignored by the people whose minds and activities they were trying to change. They came preaching that the people had turned away from God and worshiping God. And sins went with these, and the sins were usually something like worshiping other gods, ignoring God, or mistreating orphans and widows who in those times had little or no rights and were easily ignored by society. I say that being a prophet was a rotten job, not only because it could get one killed, but that people rarely even listened to a prophet as a group. The prophet was compelled to speak from faith, was usually ignored, and that was that. Then in comes Jonah. He doesn't want to be a prophet, at least to that wicked city of Nineveh. Perhaps Nineveh was the Las Vegas of its day. Not to insult the current Las Vegas, where one of my very best friends is a pastor of a Presbyterian church there. Shout out to you, David. And uh, nothing but love for the real Las Vegas. But Jonah, upon hearing the mission straight from God to go to Nineveh and warn that wicked city, runs instead away from God, out to sea, and into the belly of a great big fish which uh, we've already covered in the broadcast. Jonah resolves this with God and warns Nineveh. Nineveh, much to the chagrin of Jonah, actually listens to the prophet and and they repent. This almost never works. The people rejected the prophets most every time. Now, if you were Jonah and you knew this, you might be happy that your job actually made a difference. Who doesn't want to make a difference? 
But no, not Jonah. Jonah is upset that God would not judge the people of Nineveh for the sinners that they certainly were and make them pay the ultimate price. So the next time you sin or do something wrong, be glad that you can look to God for forgiveness and not Jonah. Jonah needs some lessons, and we get lessons along the way. Here's the first one. God's forgiveness is bigger than our anger. This is good news for starters. We cry for fairness, and when we think it is missing, we get angry at others, and and sometimes at God. God can take it, thankfully. But God wants us to understand the way forgiveness works. This was true when Jesus was accused of hanging out with sinners. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means, he said. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jonah doesn't want the people of Nineveh to be saved, but rather to pay for their crimes. He complains to God, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish. At the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. Jonah wants those people to pay for their crimes. We get the same way with politics, with the distribution of wealth, with the way our country and other countries arm and defend themselves. I'm not being subversive here, but I do believe that Forgiveness should be our go-to because it is God's go-to. Secondly, if you want fairness, you won't like it. We want life to be fair, sometimes for God's sake, but many times and more likely for our own sake. We do not like to see the wicked prosper, and we may at times define the wicked as simply people who are not us or who have different agendas than our own. I love this story. A preacher was making his rounds to his parishioners on a bicycle when he came upon a little boy trying to sell a lawnmower. How much do you want for the mower? asked the preacher. And the little boy said, I just want enough money to go out and buy me a bicycle. After a moment of consideration, the preacher asked, hmm, will you take my bike and trade for it? The little boy asked if he could try it out first, that is, the bicycle, and after riding the bike around a little while, said, Mister, you've got yourself a deal. The preacher took the mower and began to try and crank it. He pulled on the cord a few times with no response from the mower at all. The preacher called the little boy over and said, I can't get this mower to start. Well, the little boy said, That's because you have to cuss at it to get it started. And the preacher said, Well, I am a minister and I cannot cuss. It has been so long since I have been saved that I do not even remember how to cuss. (laughs) The little boy looked at him happily and said, Just keep pulling down that cord, mister. It'll come back. (laughs) So, Do we always get what we deserve in life? That's the question. I've looked this up on the internet as a a broad question just to see if people had addressed it, and and they did, uh, and they keep on addressing this question. I strongly disagree with much of what Anad Krishna, innovator of several self-empowerment techniques, answered on the question. But I do love his last word. When I was thinking about what I deserved, and what I did not, I lived miserably. I think those are good answers. Do we get what we deserve? Some people say no, a couple say yes. Another asks, well, who is to be the judge? Something we talked about last week. Another answer is, it is human nature to somehow make up our own minds as to what we perceive we deserve in life or not deserve. But that is not a given. That is just our own interpretation 
of our expectations. Aside from this, we are usually quite instrumental in judging others. Who deserves what? Who does not deserve something, etc. The truth is there is absolutely no set framework of what anybody deserves or does not deserve in life. Those are the quotes. I strongly disagree. Every now and then I get to leave my more mundane and practical thoughts and explore these existential questions like this one. Western thought looks more at cause and effect, while Eastern thought focuses more on the full sphere of action and reaction being one big thing. Both East and West point us to eventual consequences in the future which is odd since little else is agreed upon. The difference is Christ and only Christ. Christ comes to save all because all need to be saved. In Romans 3.10, we get two quotes there by Paul of the psalmist. First from 14.1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. And then the quote from Psalm 53, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have committed abominable justice. There is no one who does good. And we get the summation in Romans in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. What then? Are we any better? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Greeks alike are, are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. The point seems to be sadly lost on Jonah, which is why he gets his object lesson of the plant. God tries to explain to the reluctant prophet just a little bit about grace. Is it right for you to be angry about the bush and... And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you're concerned about the bush for which you didn't labor and which you didn't grow, came into being in a night and it, and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh? We use this little poem at Christmas time, mostly, but I think it fits well with our, our theme today and I'd like to share it with you if I may. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a Savior. I'd like to get to the third point. You can fight God, but you won't win. You won't win the argument. You won't win the contest. You won't outlast or outwit or outplay the Almighty God. I think that's the theme for Survivor. John 6, verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's the answer. Last week, last week we talked about the grace under which Joseph operated between him, his brothers, and God. Today's lesson is one in repentance. And such a good lesson that Jesus himself used it as a teaching tool in both Matthew and Luke's Gospels, respectively. Here is Matthew's word from Jesus when the people asked him for a sign. Jesus answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was for three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and see something greater than Jonah is here. The sign from Jonah came clearly with a message. Repent. 
what is the inexorable will of God? With so many grand adjectives to describe God, infinite, powerful, loving, unchangeable. God's will is perhaps shockingly simple. God's will is for God's people to shed their reluctance and repent and be saved. God's will is for us to set aside our slowness to believe and be changed by God's gospel healing through the blood of the Lamb that was slain. God's will is that we stop being reluctant servants, dabbling in faith, and step fully into what God is calling us to do today. God's will is for us to give up the reluctance of a Jonah and embrace the repentance of a Nineveh. Amen.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forever. Amen.